I was looking back at some of my um, older videos, and not older videos, but uh, like within the last year or so, and I, I was looking at the Tim Burton videos because I was going to cover at, at least most of Tim Burton's filmography, and I, I guess I abandoned that project. I abandoned a lot of projects um, on, on this channel. But Batman 1989 was always something that I really wanted to do because it's a, it's a film I've always loved and and then not just in the kind of atypical way uh, of growing up and being really, really uh, <laughs> into uh, Michael Keaton's um, portrayal of Batman, which which I, I definitely defend and think is possibly one of the best, if not the best. I like that it's quiet, simple, internal. I like things like that. Um, more than that, though, I think uh, with every Tim Burton film, right, Justin, you get these um, kind of these great atmospheric statements. I mean, there's, there's a great uh, debate, or not debate, there's a great argument you can make that Tim Burton, like Brian De Palma, like kind of others of his particular pedigree, that they're almost less filmmakers and more visual aesthetes, visual stylists, like creators of atmosphere. And like a film like Batman, and most of his other films, why I call him an auteur as well, or his Bay is in that same kind of... Uh, German expressionist uh, monster movie kind of feel, uh, you know, rejection of of an objective reality, right? It's just the jagged lines yeah. and like hyper expressive moments. Uh, it's almost as if the acting inside of it, like even Jack Nicholson here, has been criticized for being kind of hammy or chewing the scenery. Uh, but I think that it's more so. Um, that every performance and every piece of effect and, and every uh, uh, piece of architecture and every color and every every sound of music is kind of um, uh, a projection of, of the of the moment itself. In fact, that probably exaggerates the moment itself. So, I mean, I think that even Jack Nicholson's performance and all this is great because it's all in, in proportion to the intensity or emotionality of the moment. So... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you talk about how it's like of its time. I think um, the use of the Prince song towards the end is is really indicative of that fact. Uh, Joker is like on that float, and uh, the money is running down, and he's dancing along to Prince before Batman comes swooping in in his uh, bat uh, jet or whatever it's called. I mean, we can uh, we can poke fun at that scene. The, the prince. Oh, song, no, I'm, not um, poking, I'm not poking fun. I'm I just. I find it. I find it interesting. Like this is like the type of movie that it is. This is because this is like at the time that this was made, there weren't really that many superhero films. Uh, you had like the no. you had the Superman films um, from the '70s going on to the, I think going on into the '80s. Um, uh, but yeah, that was the, the pretty much and such. yeah. And then there was also the. Um, the movie tie-in with the uh, Batman, uh, the 1960s Batman show uh, starring Yeah, the, the Adam West TV yeah. show. That's why this film is so but, important, I think, in the Batman mythos, because it gave him a, right. a, a facelift in a, in a in kind of highlighted what was already going on in the comics from people like Frank Miller and Alan Moore. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Tim Burton was never a comic fan. He doesn't no. know if he's like dyslexic or something, but he, uh, th these are his words. I'm not like ad homing him or ableist shaming him at all. Uh, right. Uh, he said this on the commentary to, to Batman 89, that he, he still doesn't know if he's dyslexic or not, but he couldn't understand comic books as he couldn't figure out how to read the like uh, what order to read the panels in and it would always really just annoy him but there was something about the killing joke in particular that that felt to him more like a storyboard to a film or storyboard animation and he understood it a lot more and really wanted to bring that um i guess i think the arts by brian boland uh bring that kind of style uh, into the forefront uh there, there's a bit of the Alan Moore there. Uh, this this isn't a complex film. I mean, most of Burton's films no. aren't um, uh, philosophically grappling. They're not. They're not really like that. Uh, it's like you can reach philosophically, but whereas Alan Moore really uh, made the Joker a sophisticated villain, uh, Tim Burton was much more interesting in uh, actually building a, a tactile gothic like cartoon universe. 
Uh, yeah, and, and something and, he definitely did. Yeah, and bringing that to the screen, like it was something that was never really brought to the screen in that way yeah. before. Before that, I mean, people, you know, at the time that this was released, people thought it was a dark movie. I mean, yes. You, um, you look I at mean, it there there are notions that are dark, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. There's, so, there's something weird about seeing Batman's face covered in blood and Jack Nicholson's hair all like fucked up and like blood pouring down his lips, laughing. Like it's it's absurd, but it's still gothic. I will say it's a gothic right. film. Maybe not right. dark, and there's a distinction to make between the two. It is gothic, but possibly not yeah. a dark film. I mean, you talk about how it's not really. Um... Tim Burton isn't that well versed in comic books. I, I think he's even quoted once saying that he has never even read a comic book. Um, probably a little <laughs> bit of probably a little bit of hyperbole. And I think Kevin uh, Kevin Kevin Smith uh, responded to that by saying, "Well, that explains Batman." So, um, yeah, well, and so I think <sighs> with this film, what he was trying to do more so than simply adapt the comic, but was to the screen was try to adapt the iconography, the mythos, to and filter it and channel it through his aesthetic, through his sensibilities. Um, exactly, because so, it's, it's so, not a deconstruction yes. of, of the mythos or of the 60s television show. And even that was probably what Burton was most familiar with. And I know he liked the 60s television show, but it's right. not a deconstruction of the iconography. It's almost a reinterpretation uh, for right. possibly the time, but I think for, for, for a new aesthetic, for a new uh, atmosphere. And uh, exactly. channeling it, and even then, like he never sacrifices. I always, I, I he is a premier auteur, like a popular, uh, a pop artist, really, but still an auteur at the same time. In that, uh, never sacrifices uh, the, the the uniqueness of his sensibilities, of his filmic languages, for um, any pre existing materials. So you go into a, a Burton Batman film, and like if you watch it today, and you, and you are familiar with the comics and the animated uh, Bruce Tim TV show, like you should be shocked by how much Tim Burton informed uh, a completely different medium. I mean, uh, so much of this film stylistically has been uh, uh, c carried over in, into the comic book world, into video game world. And this is just a Burton vision that, that this film has more in common than, with Edward Scissorhands than The Dark Knight, in my opinion. It's more uh, thematically relevant to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can agree with that. I mean, you know, you'd look at, of course, there's like the same kind of characters and, and, and some story beats. But like uh, the, when it comes to the aesthetic, the um, sensibilities, like what he brings to the screen, is very much a Tim Burton film. Although, even with that said, I think um, the sequel, Batman Returns, is much more in line with Tim Burton's sensibilities. And it's that's much one, more and in I, line, but we have yeah. to remember that Batman 89 was like his third feature. So he, he's still like, and it's still remarkable that this early on, his craft was this fully formed because it's just a, like maybe another movie and he has it complete. He has it complete. That, that's, yeah, that's true. This, this was one of his earlier films. Um, and much of what we know um, about Burden today um, has come since from. Uh, um, it's really early to mid 90s Burton, really. Early to mid '90s, Burton's what we know of yes. when we think of him. Um, yeah. But I, and there's another uh, signature, or um, you know, a, another kind of like authorial uh, distinction in in his work that makes his work kind of kind of different or unique to him. It's always about uh, kind of championing the misfit in almost a, a, a Capra esque way that like Spielberg wishes that he could have this kind of authenticity of sentimentality because Tim Burton is a sentimental director, but it definitely uh, very, um, it doesn't feel as uh, contrived as it normally does with hmm. other directors who try this kind of sentimentality. But normally he tries to champion the misfit. And I think that here and in Batman returns, it's kind of incredible to see him give, <laughs> like these three like are uh however many characters he has in a batman film at a time these legendary misfits having this entire playground to just jump around in and, and destroy and build up uh it's really just giving these misfits the opportunity to become larger than larger than life and and with a few sentimental nods as well 
But I think that Burton, I haven't been able to figure out exactly how he does the Capra-esque, uh, almost Spielberg-like sentimentality filtered through his gothic um, kind of like visions and, and aesthetic, his style, and, and not for it to seem so kind of obnoxious or nauseating. Uh, it's only been a few times in some of his films, some of his weak films, that, that I feel that way about them. But I've never been able to figure out exactly how he's able to be obnoxiously sentimental and not be um <laughs> and, and really feel authentic at the same time i don't know how he does it i think part of that comes from uh the fact that he restrains himself uh both aesthetically and tonally um like the film is not simply um like a dark version of Batman, it, it, you you get like kind of cartoonish like um, architecture. Um, like the, the 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 skyline of of Gotham City is very much um, not hyper realistic, like like something like Nolan's no. Batman films are. It, it, it's it's very much um, a Tim Burton film, <laughs> and I think while at the time this was a darker take on Batman, ultimately. Um, I think it's it, it's it succeeds because uh, Burton finds the ba- the pr- a proper balance between um, dark and light in a way, and I think and I think he meets somewhere in the middle. Um, I think what I think in contrast, one of the issues I have with Batman Returns is it seems a little more messy in that respect, in my opinion. Uh, where yeah, there's like blood rushing down people's faces and and. Uh, these movies in both movies, but I think um, Batman Returns kind of goes um, a step further when, when Penguin like bites the nose oh, yeah. off of somebody, oh, and, and like I think and that... Cat, Catwoman scratches somebody. Here, I think, it, but then uh, with Batman Returns, um, the the third act, the conclusion, the climax, it b- just becomes a farce, which I think is funny, but. Uh, yes. But I think with this movie, the 1989 Batman, it's more consistent. It's more um, the tone that it establishes, it sticks with. The the aesthetic that it establishes, it sticks with. Um, and yeah, I I, the, um... the story is more um, normal, I feel like. <laughs> Less absurd. I mean, it's absurd well, yeah. in its own way, but uh, it's, it's, more, it's more tangible. You can come to understand it a little better. Well, I mean, every Tim Burton film um, attaches itself immediately to a very uh, per- peculiar unrealism. But a few things yeah. to speak on in in response to some of the things you said. Uh, most certainly, uh, the, the the setting and the atmosphere and the architecture uh, is incredibly important to him. Um, like. And, and every film, even Pee Wee, like Pee Wee had to live in a certain kind of universe. And he always said about about the Batman films that like it, it, it might be a twisted version of New York, and it's um it's almost like a dreamlike version of New York, maybe a fairy tale version where yeah, uh, rather than put him in New York City, he wants to put him in like a, a very in in a universe that Batman could conceivably occupy rather than just put him in New York City, but the audience, if they're not thinking too clearly about it, will just kind of think of it as an analog for New York City. And it kind of, like, works on the audience in that way, uh, which I think is, like, pretty smart as well. Um, There there are other things. Uh, The color palette of of Batman Returns was um, noticeably uh, uh, much different. I I would say it was kind of more dynamic, personally uh even the blood was like almost pitch black um right whereas whereas in batman the blood is a a pretty damn bright red in contrast to some kind of the the darkness or uh like some of the monochromatic texturing of the film uh batman returns the ending is a farce but i I think it's kind of a i think it's a brilliant film i think that there's something um about the first batman film that does at least because I know we had nothing to do with uh, really writing the script. That was a, a man named Sam Sam Ham or something. I believe that was his name, but uh, if I'm wrong, forgive me. Uh, th- there's something about it that uh, you, you feel like Tim Burton's not, not necessarily, like you said, restraining himself. But I don't know if he's restraining himself or if the studio was restraining him. And I think he was kind of let I, off the uh, the leash I be- second time around. I believe it's a little bit. Yeah, I think with the with Batman Returns, um, they gave him a lot more freedom. But then that kind of 
came back to bite them when it came to like toy sales and stuff. Oh, I love that. Because, yeah. I mean, how are you going to make an S and M Catwoman toy or a penguin toy? I mean, when I was a kid, oh I did God. have his little yeah. like rubber, not rubber duck, his little like duck vehicle that he like drove in or whatever. Like that was cool to have. Like it's not I mean, something that's it's not really it's not really for kids, but it's not really for adults either. It, you know, it's like it's that's specific. the um, that's the conundrum of of, of Britain. I could say that about pro- possibly most of his films. It's barely for Batman fans. So I mean, but you know, at the Hardly. time, you know, you know, even though he would you know do a lot of things that went against like the original canon, the original um, rules for what Batman can and should be. Uh, I think people were less picky because when like Batman would like kill somebody uh, because they didn't really get Batman on screen, uh, and I think that um, uh, people were a little more gracious then. But then, um, as they made more and more Batman movies, they they came to have like certain expectations. Um, well, I think there's certain things. Um... Batman is kind of unique in a certain way of uh kind of lending lending his identity lend, lending his uh, his license to the artistic license of, of of a lot of um pretty interesting filmmakers who I would dare to say are each kind of auteurs in their own way or at least um um ha- have a pretty identifiable kind of technique and mm. It's interesting to see Batman work as a muse for some of these uh, different people. I mean, you know, Joel Schumacher, like, barring him. I mean, even then, it's kind of interesting to see how how Joel uh, uh, it's, it's, tried to it's, leave it's his a... stamp on it, too. But watching yeah, it through Burton, Nolan, mm-hmm. and Snyder are interesting. Uh, the way that Batman worked as a muse for each of those different directors. But when it's Burton, I, I like it as pure Burton. I, I like Burton using Batman as a muse, as a misfit hero, as a misfit muse. Well, I mean, I remember his, uh, his, um, the, the way he defended uh, his, his casting of Michael Keaton, who was in Beetlejuice right before um, mm-hmm. w- w- with Burton. But uh, his defense of casting Michael Keaton in that role was that um, I want him to be like, Bruce Wayne to be a low key and like hidden kind of person, like a person who would have to wear a bat costume to kind of overcompensate for for uh, <laughs> um, for not being that physically threatening, or to amplify uh, like a, a a freakiness, a caginess that wasn't necessarily mm-hmm. like visible before. So it means yeah, even yeah, interesting it, there. It's it, it's good also because I think part of it is he wanted to cast Bruce Wayne, not, like not not so much Batman. He wanted yeah. like a stark difference between like what Batman is in the suit versus who is underneath the suit. You know, who is underneath the mask. And there is like uh, the film does kind of teeter on certain philosoph- philosophical concepts that like maybe Nolan or Snyder um, investigate uh, much more thoroughly and much later on. But um, well, the, the the whole idea of. Uh, like uh batman being like like i made you but you made me kind of idea mm-hmm. to 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 the joker yeah i think about i, I th- yeah I, th- I think that really kind of came more into fruition with um uh christopher nolan's the dark knight mm-hmm. uh, it, it most certainly did but it was yeah. surprising to see it there at all but yeah. it, of course when burton's saying it i'm not he's definitely not saying the same kind of things that nolan was saying i think he's more so saying that that, that 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 misfits foster other misfits, and that there's always um like a derivative of something that something is the son of something else. Uh, it, but it's mostly kind of like a misfit heritage. Well, that these larger than life. Uh, I I only almost despair to call them superheroes in a Burton film, but superheroes have or possess through Burton's eyes. Yeah, I think I think beyond superheroes, they're kind of more so misfits. Uh. And Burton yeah. really like embellishes that. Uh, I think when Schumacher um, approached um, the films, he he kind of wanted to turn them more into like this pop, you know. Um, well, Joel book. Schumacher yeah. being uh, well, since Joel was a w- w- was an openly gay filmmaker, if you actually mm-hmm. view, I believe at least because he says that Batman uh, and Robin is just a well, glorified toy commercial, he'll say that. But Batman Forever, if you watch it as like a queer film. It gets a bit more complicated than people give it credit for. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
And it's totally, I think it falls in line with, with, with like, the kind of 90s, uh, like, new queer cinema thing, like the Gregor Racky thing, or maybe, uh, like, the more, like, amplified neon kind of, um, kind of, uh, aesthetic. Like, it's, it's kind of insane if you view, of course, Batman Forever, not Batman and Robin, that's just a, a, a trash heap, but Batman Forever as a queer film, I'm not saying it Whoa. makes it a good movie, but I'm saying it makes it a much more interesting movie to discuss, and no one's discussing it with Whoa. the right language. Probably Batman and Robin also, honestly. I mean, I think he just double dips in like it in the uh gay aesthetic <laughs> in a way. At least that's how I look at it. I mean like you know, but you, even if even like Batman uh Forever, um he, you know, he puts like uh nipples on the on the bat suits, you know. That mm -hmm. was like <laughs> I mean it wasn't he w it was definitely going for some kind of homoeroticism there. Um, oh, yeah, like, I think know, that Batman it's, Forever it's, is an extremely queer film, for sure. Uh, but I think that Batman and Robin, I mean, by his own admission, uh, certain certain set pieces, designs, and, like, uh, a, a character costumes were created for toy sales, as opposed to um, it was at least friendly with toy sales or toys were made out of it. I mean, I know he it was almost hyper-specifically made for merchandising. Yeah, probably. I mean, if you want, like, the gayest toys and action figures imaginable. <laughs> when I was, but... like, seven or whatever age I was, I wanted them. I don't care. <laughs> Give them to me. But uh, I... I... these films are... Um... Just to contrast, Burton with Schumacher is a huge departure, let alone uh, Burton from, from Nolan. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. uh, Burton... I will say also, when I was a kid watching the movie, and I, I kind of got the same heebie-jeebie, like, goosebump feelings, every once in a while, Jack Nicholson's Joker is a fucking, like, mega creep, like a ghoul. Uh, if you remember his death when he, um, he fell off uh, the Belfry Tower, and he's just lying there covered in blood, and, like, that, that smile permanently, like, fixed on his, like, kind of uh disheartening face uh there's like the, the this 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 voice box that keeps laughing like inside of his chest that gordon has to go and shut off i remember being a kid and just thinking that was just so like i was actually kind of scared by that when i was uh probably five years old or younger i was like i'm so happy that batman took this person down he was just creepy that's a superficial observation but it's one that i wanted to include here especially if we're i think about to go to Nolan, kind of, and uh, compare a bit of the old Nolan to, uh, to to Burton. In many ways, like, The Dark Knight actually kind of, I wouldn't say it's a remake of Batman, but it, it takes a lot of um, ideas from Batman. Uh, it and, really and, does. And it's, it's, it's kind it of... Um... Around. Like, uh, so, at the end of Batman, for example, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically he, uh, he lets Joker fall. Um, to the ground, and then he continues laughing. Yes. The, the joke goes on even after his death. But in um, uh, Christopher Nolan's uh, The Dark Knight, um, he gets pushed off the building. He continues, he's laughing as he falls down, but Batman saves him, which kind of is a stark contrast to, um, to Burden's film. And I feel like, like in a way, like, uh, Nolan is engaging in that sort of dialogue it, it, where he's um, continuing to talk about um, he's continuing to discuss the Batman mythos like in new ways about uh, and addressing the, the ideology of Batman, which in my opinion, um, he really misses out on and Batman begins and the dark Knight rises. I, I, I do not like those movies. Um, I think the dark Knight succeeds because um you have Joker as an antagonistic force, like constantly challenging that ideology. That that that's that's flawed at the core. Um, True. Uh, you brought up that parallel with with the Burton film. There's one right before it as well. Uh, when Batman crashes that kind of Prince parade. Uh, before I forget it, I'm not going on a tangent, but the th the first time we hear that a uh, Prince song when they're vandalizing the museum it's one of my favorite Burton scenes I think that's an incredible and exquisite and kind of anarchic scene in and of itself as well but when Batman crashes the parade at the end where Joker gasses everybody it, it it's almost paralleled as well with that scene in Nolan with I believe the motorbike or something I just remember Joker standing oh, on the road like, going, come, come on, on hit come me. on hit me yeah yeah there's something yeah. similar and like like he stands there. Yeah, 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 with I his can, like, uh, uh, it's, it's like incredibly cartoonish gun that's like as a barrel 
four feet long, you know, <laughs> and uh, he's just like trying to edge him closer and closer and closer to the point of like almost playing chicken with a bat wing. But um, there's that parallel as well. And the ideology, I will say about Tim Burton's films that none of them even, I think, flirt with the kind of objectivist philosophy that Nolan imbued yes. the character yeah. with. That's, yeah, that's I call that exactly a, what... a flaw on, on Nolan's part. Yes. I think The Dark Knight uh, is great, but the Batman Begins and Dark Knight Rises, to me, is, is almost uh, uh, kind of like so hyper-conservative that it's obnoxious. Yeah, I could see I could see that, but I also think that they don't really have um, consistent um, ideologies, even within that conservative uh, my, uh, ideas. Um, I think uh, Dark Knight succeeds, as I've said before, because you constantly have that you know obviously evil force um, challenging uh, that flawed ideology, and then but then like you know it, I think that rises just kind of completely detours and like well we're like i love I, I do love the it. dark knight in, in a large way i like the dark knight a, a lot uh but he does fumble the ball for me nolan does when um the, the 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 conservative almost propagandist texturing he does incorporate into the film is like is, is, is way it re reflects almost um in a very heavy-handed uh, on the nose way uh what, what was going on in our own government at the time i cool. mean doesn't batman have to spy on every single like cell phone or every single person in gotham to find the the where the joker is and alfred like admonishes him for it but it's just like th theatrics it's just it was, whatever it was, it was lucius fox actually but um but oh, no, okay, I think, okay. but, but but i think it's also framing that as um as morally questionable. I mean, they, they admit it. I mean, morally questionable, it. but also um, ultimately in Nolan's universe, like morally just because he got uh, the agent of chaos because he had to do it. Like it's something you have to do. Well, I, and that's I'm not, not something that you have to do. Absolutely not. I mean, Nolan often presents us in those movies with kind of um, false uh, moral quandaries. And then even panders to me at the very end about those two boats not blowing each other up. Like, it, it turns very quickly from a great, like, Michael Mann-inspired crime saga to just pandering to me about... Uh, in, in a very obnoxiously political way. And I just didn't really like it. At the end. At the end. I, I it's really interesting. Say. I actually, um, I actually like the ending. I mean, and it, it's, it's. I, see, I think the the mistake that a lot of people think about Nolan is that he's going for realism. I don't think he's going for hyper realism. I think just relative realism. You know, like Batman. You know, Tim Burton's Batman was relative realism to Adam West's Batman. You know, the Adam West Batman series. Um, I think you know because if you look at somebody like Two Face, you have like. Um, <laughs> there's no way somebody would like live like that like and they wouldn't talk like that either if half of their lip is burned off but it's like it's it's like a thematically uh, resonant thing and True. and i think for the record that the two-faced moral quandary or whatever is is the best executed part of the ending i do like the two-face arc it's the other two uh moral dilemmas and the well, climax that i have a problem with well okay but but when it comes to like the boats you know i Based on, I, I think um, logically that wouldn't happen. But I think what Nolan's saying basically there. But is I think that... Nolan's illogical. I don't think it's relative realism. I think he's a deeply unimaginative filmmaker. Wasn't he given a film about dreams and they like just roads went up and down and buildings got larger and smaller? Like well, he's fucking well, uninspired. He just, he just like took from um, mm. Satoshi Kon anime films. Um, and oh, did just, he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he just like made it look worse. <laughs> um, oh wow well i mean he's deep to me he's deeply unimaginative uh well, which is kind sure. of a sign of of a conservative artist uh i'm not saying he's not talented i but i am saying yeah. that i don't know if nolan thinks his films are like relative realism or if he was even trying to be imaginative because none well, of it to I mean, me is inspired i mean even like even if you compare dark knight to dark knight rises i feel like there's a there's a stark uh contrast in like in ideas like uh, I, like the way inter like the way that I interpreted like the ending of, of of the Dark Knight was not necessarily that Bruce Wayne would go into hiding. I mean, I, I mean, Dark, I mean, Batman 
maybe, or at least he wouldn't work with the law. What you don't but, think that the that the billionaire messiah would like go into hiding and then like rise three days later to save the world? Like no, it, did, it, did, no, it, it didn't make it didn't it didn't make much sense to me. Um, but as for the ships, no, I actually do like that part because I I like the idea of um you know it's 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 like a conservative moral like idea of like people are good at heart <laughs> it's it's sentimental he go he taps into sentimentality but i think that it brings um a level of hope um in a film that's otherwise um um seemingly cynical in a way i mean like, yeah you but, know, but the, you but know, the I, sentimentality you know, of that scenario alone is, is more hokey than even sam raimi would attempt or the original series of star trek wouldn't even go that fucking like hokey I think that maybe the issue there is it may not realize that it's, you know, quote-unquote hokey. Um, well, but... no, because I don't think Nolan has much self-awareness as a director. And by the way, I'm saying all of this kind of um, intense criticism of Nolan, and Dark Knight is one of my favorite superhero films. I think that there, there are so many parts of it that, 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 make, that, that astonish me completely. For real. Yeah, I, li- I like The Dark Knight more than I like most superhero films. Um, I, th- I, I mean, think for I'll, the record, I'll, if I'm like here, I mean, I like uh, Batman Returns and Logan probably are my favorite superhero movies. But I mean, that's a tangent. But just in case someone's wondering, those yeah, are the, yeah. And yeah. I guess I should say I, I'm not really even a fan of uh, Tim Burton's Batman that much. I I, I admire aspects of it. Um, same with Batman Returns. Uh, same with uh, Richard Donner Superman. Uh, I think the superhero uh, yeah, films, yeah. I, the superhero films I do like um, are. Um, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, including the third one, and then The Dark Knight, and uh, some of Zack Snyder's films. But that's a whole other tangent. Cool. Oh, I mean, uh, we're about to go down that tangent, I feel. <laughs> we should um, give him some equal, equal uh, So with, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll bar um, Justice League from conversation, because arguably we didn't, you know, the film that was released is not his ideas. But um, with Batman v Superman, you have... Uh, I think basically it, it's like the polar opposite of um, Tim Burton's Batman or probably polar opposite of, of Adam West's Batman, uh, probably, if we're going to be more realistic here. Um, uh, basically, I feel like it's Nolan with balls, dude. I feel like it's Nolan yes, yes, like, I, with I fucking balls. Like, it's not I, like I, I'm, I, Snyder is like, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to give you a Randy version, a Fountainhead Atlas Shrugged fucking version of these people. And I'm not going to yes. like hide. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give it to you like Messiah complex, well, everything. Well, but then it's also like really critical of their like <laughs> approaches to heroism. Um, well, yeah. Maybe, and that, that, and that even like, shows that Snyder has more of a grasp on this philosophy than no, oh, no he did. His films he, are overly complicated. He 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 definitely yeah. does. I think. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think the Dark Knight may have been a fluke. Um, it, parts I, of it feel <laughs> like it, or he had like um, really good uh, feedback because, from people. And if you care about, if you analyze it as a trilogy, um, it, it it really the second part suffers, in my opinion. Like like in terms of like ideological ideological conversation consistency. Um, whereas, but I think. In isolation, The Dark Knight, I think, works. Um, and I think Batman v Superman, now some people, some, I have some Snyder fans on my channel, some people may not like <laughs> a few things I may have to say. I, I, I think Batman v Superman is, is an underrated film. I don't think it's a great film by any means, in my opinion. But I think um, as far as like <laughs> uh, addressing like Batman's ideology, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think it succeeds, at least, at least, at least comparative to uh, to no one. I think so. No, absolutely. Um, and it probably surprises no one. Well, maybe it surprises. But by, by the way, I just uh, defended Snyder in comparison to Nolan, but I don't think Snyder's ever directed a good movie. Uh, I'm not he's, a I'm not I'm not a Snyder fan, but I think that he's, he's a much more confident and capable director than than Nolan is. Even though I think Nolan well, has made some good films, especially with action. I feel like yes. Um, uh, like uh, with action I, I mean, and the specific philosophy that's inherent to uh, to yes. these superheroes, at least I don't know when the philosophical turn came. It probably was with Batman Begins, but they kind of had to embrace the objectivist philosophy because most superheroes, barring someone well, like Spider Man, have to be that way. 
I mean, they're trying they to make it realistic. <laughs> so, or, or like yeah, but but, e- but even that's an, an untruth uh, because I mean, liberalism is what has a uh, well. A, yeah, I mean, like. I mean, like for example, um, the Dark Knight kind of ha- address kind of addresses like police corruption in a way, and then like in the end, like uh, in order to to preserve like uh, a sense of um, good, it's not just. Of, of, but the problem is, of, it's not just police corruption; it's corruption of government, and that the yes. only one who can save us is the rich billionaire on a hill. I blame the resurgence of yeah. superhero movies for the Donald Trump presidency in a very large way, like. Culture started looking towards people like Tony Stark and Bruce Wayne, these messiah savior motherfuckers. And like culturally, we were taught over time that these are the well, people who can save us and fuck the government. So I mean, yeah, those it, films are problematic. And I, you know what? Great job, Burton, for not even thinking about politics when you were making these films. Yeah, I mean, you know, The Dark Knight. Uh, Gordon believes it's better to lie to the public and and bury the truth of corruption. Um, just for the stability yeah. and sanity of the public at large, so it's like liberalism, like complacency, uh, with 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 it, the. Yeah. And I don't really mean to alienate any anyone listening or watching with, with with some of my harsh language here, but I feel that that Nolan and Snyder are are, are pretty uh, pretty loud in, in this philosophy, and it'd be like inauthentic of me not to directly. Well, a- analyze well, yeah, that part of it. Allowed, it's such a large allowed, part. I'm trying. I'm trying to pinpoint how exactly something like Tim Burns' Batman um, doesn't engage in those ideas so much. Like, 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 like. Um, I know Burton. Oh, just Tim Burton's like a wonderkind. Like, I have no idea how yeah, he, he doesn't he, like, he frame, appear he, contrived, yeah, and yet he, he is totally designed. Like, I have no well, idea. He frames everything kind of like this fairy tale. Um, yes. Where, but but that doesn't mean that the politics aren't there too. Even like I mean, I, 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 I uh, you could compare him to Leone a lot. They both made these fairy tale films that didn't necessarily like even a western. Like the western genre is supposed to be conservative as well. It's supposed to be like the outlaw or the lone sheriff in town standing up against outside bandits without much help. Like it's kind of supposed to be that way. And yeah. even Leone films, I would say, are not overtly political. It's not like Blondie. I mean, even The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, it, it doesn't necessarily pick a side in the Civil War. It shows atrocities on, 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 the, on the Union side, but I mean, we also see, um, also see the Confederate side as well. Like, it's still not overtly political. And maybe it's because of the fairy tale language of these people. Uh, like, Del mm-hmm. Toro is almost the same way. Like, the fairy tale comes first before any kind of philosophy or that, political message. That, that might be what it is. But, and then with, like, uh, then with uh, Tim, or, or sorry, Christopher Nolan's uh, Batman films, he, he tries to bring it more to reality. But then it's like, and he makes it darker. But then it's like, well, but with that comes all the political implications of, yes. of, like, of the ideas of, like, the villains, you know. Uh, I think Joker is a great villain uh, in his movie, uh, and th- and I actually I actually like most of the villains in Tim Burton's films, um, at least like mm-hmm. Razal Ghul and stuff. But the problem is, uh, and this is a problem I have with um, Black Panther also. You have the villain, but you don't really have the hero. You don't have good enough reason for the hero to oppose the villain. At least you don't provide a good enough reason. I feel like. Um, where it's almost like, I mean, yeah, I don't agree with with everything the villain's doing, but it's like, well, the hero is kind of. Um, I think it not plays much. into you you saying that the film was a fluke because there's no possible yeah. way they could have known Ledger was going to be that transcendentally on point. No yeah. fucking way they knew that. There was nothing in Ledger's catalog that hinted at that kind of. Uh, uh, capability well yeah i mean like he's great in like broke back mountain but it's like it's, it's no but, but this is a totally like, different kind of yeah. thing this is like nuts this is that, that that performance is fucking ludicrously good and there's no way they could have known that and i don't think that christian bale really thought he had to do anything quite different i don't think that anyone really knew what they had on their hands and i do give a lot of credit to that film with the writing for joker and the performance of ledger there's a lot yeah writing on that it's kind of like the saving well, grace of the film yeah, and, 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 and 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 with um the existence of the dark knight it, it's it's a little difficult for me to watch um tim burton's batman film and get much of anything out of jack nicholson's joker unfortunately i, fact, I get like, um i mean i feel like the jack nicholson's joker to me is a uh, I mean, 
um, despite the <laughs> how fucking old he is. Uh, it's it's more similar to how I feel about the the Joker in the comic books. I mean, this this kind of cartoonish. Yeah. Um, anarchic villain. I mean, he's definitely not, he's just an agent of chaos, but he would never say the word chaos. He would never refer to himself that way. Uh, yeah. I'd like Jack Nicholson's it? Joker quite a bit, but um, if there's anything that's aged the poorest, uh, that's aged the worst from the Tim Burton films, it's probably Nicholson's performance. Even Kim Basinger, while we're here uh, playing Vicky Vale, was extraordinary in the film. And I know that she was hired like day before, like, day of, uh, day of uh, shooting. And she was extraordinary in the film. She was a very good actor. The thing that's aged the worst is uh, Jack Nicholson's interpretation of the Joker. And it's not that it's a bad one, it's just that somehow... Well, it's Jack <laughs> Somehow we've had Heath Jack Ledger Nicholson. and... Well, yeah, uh, but, but that's also at the same time... Like, that, that would be the popular casting choice for, for, for eons within the comic book community was just cast Jack yeah. Nicholson, just cast Jack Nicholson because he had that personality. But I yeah. wish he was more Mick Murphy than whatever the fuck he was here. But still, he's, he's fine. Um, hell, his, his RP Mick Murphy is more in line with Faith Ledger's Joker. Than, yeah. Uh... <laughs> you, you also have uh, Penguin in, in that movie too. Uh, at, the, um, at Danny DeVito. <laughs> And I want to the cuckoo's nest. Oh yeah, you do, you do, don't you? He's uh, <laughs> yeah. like tequila or something. I've got what he is. He's just hit me, hit me. Is all he says at the poker yeah, table. Been He's, a oh, been Danny DeVito is brilliant. Danny DeVito, I thought was a great penguin. I mean, Michelle Pfeiffer transcends as Catwoman. Wonderful Catwoman. But a Nolan's lot, just a lot uh, better than uh, she's a, she's a lot better than than Anne Hathaway's Catwoman. Anne oh, Hathaway. I, I agree. Uh, Anne Hathaway's Catwoman. I have no idea how. <sighs> That that's. Uh, uh, I feel like Nolan doesn't understand fucking much. All right, um, <laughs> reality has a liberal. If reality does indeed have a liberal bias, then Nolan's films are the most outlandishly fantastical of them all, and I mean that in the most insulting way possible. Yeah. <laughs> Bane goes down to the fucking fucking Wall Street and is literally parroting. Um, um, the Occupy movement and villainizing it on film at a time when Occupy was a fucking like thing, it was a fucking real yeah. thing and an oh, important yeah. thing. Like Nolan and should it, be fucking harpooned well, over that. Well, it's just like you know, at the I mean, I saw this. I, I rewatched these movies like a year ago, and um, if I remember, if I recall correctly, a lot of the civilians uh, joined Bane's cause either out of out of like desperation or out of um or because they believed in his cause so what you have in the dark knight rises is ultimately batman teaming up with all these incompetent uh police officers you know because they're all dispatched in the sewer uh that with yeah. all these incompetent police officers like fighting the civilians fighting the the the, the radicals um like to put order into things the way i see it if if the dark knight rises happens I hope you're Team Bane. <laughs> Man, I'd, I'd be Team Bane, I mean, too. I just can't imagine a more boogeyman, more, like, unimaginative uh, 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 specter of doom um, that that's supposed to represent the talking points of Occupy Wall Street than fucking Bane. Like, it, yeah. it's kind of worse than those, like, boomer, you know, pro-Trump cartoons. It's, like, worse than that. Uh, it has like no imagination to it and we won't even get into what the fuck tom hardy thought he was doing we won't even get uh, into that i don't even know <laughs> i still don't know to this day uh, i don't i also don't know though whether or not i like it or i hate it <laughs> like, like, there's something to it uh he seems to be really it's a very very confident performance i just can't tell if it's the most misguided thing or the most ahead of its time thing and i guess that only time will tell for that um, but, uh, I think that looking at all of these different Batman films, um, helps us view, uh, Tim Burton's Batman, like, in relation to them. And I yes. think it's definitely the most unique take that we have on film of it so far. And I think it, it might be the most, to me, um, artistically sound one. Hmm. I had to think about that one. I, in some ways, and philosophically so, sound. If his philosophy is as well, simple as misfits writ large, then he yeah, did it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, well, he's talking about philosophically sound, but I think the maybe the issue there is maybe it's more like an absence of of philosophical engagement. 
maybe that's what makes us succeed. Um, but at the same time, I don't. I feel like when I, I would like more out of those movies. I guess um, I wouldn't. Well, I mean, these movies are made by giant studios. I wouldn't want to be pandered. Uh, uh, y- y- you know, uh, leftist talking points from from a studio. Anyway, it'd be insincere. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely his films are sincere. Yeah, that's how I thought about uh, the new Joker movie. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Uh, like, I, no, I, felt I haven't. Like, you know, it's like these, you know, these big corporations, you know, trying to do a milk toast uh, socialist message. You exactly. Know, and, so I would rather yeah. have something sincere any day than something uh, politically charged, even if I agree with the politics of it. And I think that Tim Burton within the studio system made very sincere films over and over again. They weren't politically motivated, but they were incredibly sincere. And I can't well, help but... Yeah, but if they're not politically motivated, do you think that maybe they're a little politically passive? In a way, and, and, and maybe to his not at all because I mean, I mean I don't, well you could you you've criticized uh, Big Fish before for kind of passively um, promoting uh, you know the, the U.S. troops. Um, well, I don't I don't feel uh, that was passive. I feel that was overt and a relic from the Spielberg drafts of the film. Um, but most of the time, I think Tim Burton films they they champion misfits. Misfits are those that don't fit in with society. Misfits are usually um, almost destitute or abandoned or orphaned. Uh, that there, there yeah. are, there is a political energy to his interpretation of the misfit, but um, it, it, it's not yeah, necessarily it's, uh, it's, partisan. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, I can see that. You know, I think, I think in some ways it works. Yeah, I, I criticize Big Fish because there's still Spielberg's fingerprints all over the fucking movie, but somehow Tim Burton was able to uh, filter a lot of the emotions from the passing of his own father. In, into that film itself, but there's just so much th- yeah. that is, is uh, obnoxiously sentimental about Big Fish for me. I know a lot of people like it, and, and there is a lot of good in it. Um, there is a bit of mastery here and there, but... That, that might be my favorite um, Tim Burton film, actually, but it, it has been a while. Maybe if I were to rewatch it today, I'd, I'd um, yeah. be a little more critical. It, it's hard to say. So, I don't know if I would call his films like politically passive or politically disengaged when the heroes of his films are these outsiders, are, are these people who don't fit into society. Um, and the status quo, really. I mean, the, these people challenge the status quo at every step. That's what Edward Scissorhands did just by existing, not even doing anything. By trying to fit in, he challenged the status mm-hmm. quo. And the status quo couldn't accept him into their like suburban um, pastel uh, universe of care and he had to live in, in isolation because status quo the society would not accept him I mean I think that's a, that could be a political statement it's more a fairy tale of course but that's a politically charged statement against the status quo I think that that's much better than spying on everybody in the suburban city to try to find Heath Ledger inside of it like <laughs> <laughs> I brought it back yeah. to that. I apologize. I no, I could. Yeah, no, I could. I could see that. I I could see the argument there. I'd ha- I would have to think about that a little more though, to really know where exactly I stand with that. Oh um, yeah, and don't don't think I'm making the argument that Tim Burton is a political filmmaker because he he he's not. He's not. But I think that the the the, the symbolism, the language of his films, um, lend itself to challenging the status quo, no matter what that that means. And what universe, no matter what universe he creates, it's about uh, characters who don't fit into it, always.